Well, good morning, everyone. And hey, a big thanks to the worship team for leading us this morning. Uh, Hey, if I haven't met you before, I'm Ben, and I'm the pastor who works with the youth and the young adults here at Summit Drive, and such a joy to be able to share with you all this morning. Growing up, I was quite the sports fan. As a little kid, I loved watching the Vancouver Canucks. And then at about 11 years old, I kind of gave up on them. And then after that, for several years, my Sunday afternoons involved hours and hours and hours of watching NFL football. Go Seahawks! Now, no doubt, for any of you in this room who are sports fans, you would know that watching the last two minutes of the fourth quarter of a game that's going down to the wire is exciting. Like, it's really exciting. Like, your eyes are glued to the TV. But you know what? When your team is down 42 to 14 with two minutes left, well, you kind of feel like turning off the TV at that point. Those last two minutes of the game then, they are not the most exciting, nor are they the most important part of every football game. Certainly not in games like that. But there is another moment in the football game watching experience that's pretty much always exciting. Even if it's a 3-10 and 10 team playing against a 10-3 and 3 team, And it's that moment when the game is just about to begin. When the players come running out onto the field, when fireworks blast into the air and the home crowd cheers for their team as they get ready to start the game. And why is that moment exciting in pretty much every game? Because the score is 0-0. It's anyone's game to win at that point. And even if your team is coming off four straight losses, none of that really matters right now. That's all in the past. It's a new game now. It's 0-0, and it's time to start. Well, welcome to almost 2024, everyone. I don't know if we're allowed to say Happy New Year yet or not. I don't know. Happy New Year. Happy almost New Year. But hey, here we are. We are on the cusp of a new year. And it's a time to start, or to start once again. With a new year comes a sense of freshness, comes this, comes this sense of resetting, comes a sense that the past is now behind us, and we can now move forward into something new. It feels like that zero zero moment in the game. It's a great time to make new commitments. Obviously, lots of people have New Year's resolutions on their minds right now. And when it comes to our spiritual lives, our lives of relating to the God who made us and loves us, for some of us, this might be the perfect time to ask ourselves the question, where do I start? I know that many of you in this community have been hanging out here uh, for a little while, exploring the Christian faith and exploring all of your questions about it. Or others of you, uh, maybe you've recently made a commitment to follow Jesus, and now you're kind of in those early stages of figuring out what's next for you on this journey. Where do I start? Where do I start in building a life of following Jesus? Maybe that's your question. Or For others of you, you've been following Jesus for a really long time. But for you as well, as a new year approaches, you sense that freshness. You you sense that chance to reset. And so maybe for you, the question is, where do I start once again when it comes to building a life that prioritizes what matters the most? Today, we are going to look at three different texts from Scripture uh, that together help us answer that big question, where to start. We'll begin by focusing in on what is of first importance, the gospel message itself. 
we'll then see that the gospel message requires a response on our part. And then we'll focus in on what it looks like to respond rightly to the good news of Jesus. I invite you all to pray with me as we begin. Father, we do thank you so much, O Lord, for the, the new year ahead, Lord. We thank you in advance for it. We thank you, Lord, for that sense of, of freshness that we might be experiencing right now, that, that chance to reset that a new year brings. And Father, we thank you for the scriptures, and we pray now that you would give us an openness to the voice of your Spirit and to, you, and to what you want to speak to each of our hearts this morning. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first text we will look at today is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 5. And if you have a Bible, you could open up there if you want to. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Here, the Apostle Paul tells us the thing that we need to focus in on more than anything else, the thing that is of first importance. And what is that thing? Well, it's not a word of advice. It's not even a really important commandment of God. It's a historical reality that changes everything. It's the gospel message itself. Let me ask, has anyone ever asked you the question, what is the gospel? Or perhaps asked just a little bit differently, what is the central message of Christianity? Like, what's this Christianity thing all about? No doubt, the gospel message can be looked at from various angles and explained in a number of ways, but this text right here gives us perhaps the clearest description of the gospel that we'll find in the whole Bible. So let's just highlight a few things from this text here this morning. Uh, First, the gospel, it's about Christ and what he has done, not about us and what we do. What is this thing that is of first importance? What's the gospel? That Christ died for our sins. That's what Paul says, and then he goes on from there. The gospel is about Christ. Leslie Newbigin writes this, The content of the gospel is Jesus Christ in the fullness of his ministry, death, and resurrection. The gospel is this and not anything else. And why is it important that we see that? Well, for one thing, we live in a culture where a lot of people think that at the heart of Christianity is a message that says that we should love other people and we should do good to others. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who express, you know, something along those lines in terms of kind of their understanding of what Christianity is all about. And most people think, yeah, that's, that's a pretty cool religion. We're all kind of good with that. Um, I hear a lot of people saying those sorts of things that I have conversations with. Now, it is true that Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Absolutely. And engaging in works of justice and for us to live lives of loving others, no doubt those are essential parts of what living out the Christian faith should look like. But all of this is an implication of the gospel. If we believe the good news of Jesus and allow this message to transform us, we will be people who love our neighbors well. But the gospel, the central message of Christianity, is not love others or be a good person or care about justice. The gospel is not about what you and I do. The gospel is news about what someone else has done. The gospel is about Christ Second thing I'll say about the gospel, it's a story, the true story of God that centers on Jesus' death and resurrection. Note that Paul gives us a sequence of events here in this text. He says, Christ died, he was buried, he was raised again. If you read through the book of Acts, you might notice that every time someone shares the message of the gospel, the story of Jesus is told in some way or another. 
And his death and resurrection are often highlighted, as Paul highlights them here. And note note that Paul says that Christ's work was all according to the Scriptures. He says that twice in this text, actually. Which reminds us that the story of Jesus is part of a wider story. Jesus' coming, his life, his death, and his resurrection are the climax of the big story of God. Jesus is at the center of the big story of God. And the gospel is the true story of God that centers on Jesus, and particularly his death on the cross and his resurrection on the third day. But this story is not a story like your favorite fictional novel. Not at all. It's not a story that's written merely to inspire us or merely to, you know, stir up our imaginations. It's a true story about real things that happen in real history. And a third thing I'll say about the gospel, it's a story that makes claims about our stories and requires a response. The cross... There's a cross behind me here. And and the cross is sometimes said to be at the very center of the gospel. And note that Paul here gives us a reason why Christ died. Christ died for our sins. And that means that you and I have sinned. It means that you and I, we've messed stuff up in our lives. We've actually rejected God as first and best. The story of the Bible begins with God creating humans in his own image and likeness, creating us with the potential to do many good and wonderful things. But in Genesis 3, we see that the very first people in the story, they turn their backs on God, and they choose to do their own thing instead. And like those first people, we do the same. We choose to love other things more than we love the creator God who made us and loves us. We choose to do our own thing rather than yielding to God and his ways. There's a fundamental problem with us, and that is the problem of sin. And the Bible tells us that sin leaves us separated from God But the good news is that the story doesn't end there. The gospel message claims that you and I, we we might not be as good as we like to think we are, but Jesus came to deal with this problem of sin. And he does it by taking it upon himself. He does it by bearing the punishment that we deserve for our sins, for our rejection of God. He bears that punishment in his own body on the cross. He lays down his life, willingly dying for your sins and my sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could experience new and eternal life. That is the central message of Christianity. That is the gospel. That is the good news. As a new year begins, and as we start or start once again It is this message that we need to keep in front of us. It is this message that is to be the thing that shapes us and defines us. It is this message that is to be the the lens that we look at everything else through. And even if you've heard this message a million times and believed it for as long as you can remember, when it comes to our life in Christ, like when it comes to our life of, of following Jesus, This is and always will be the thing that is of first importance. Tim Keller writes this, The gospel is not just the ABCs, but the A to Z, or the A to Z, of the Christian life. It is inaccurate to think that the gospel is what saves non-Christians, and then Christians mature by trying harder to live according to biblical principles. It is more accurate to say that we are saved by believing the gospel, and then we are transformed in every part of our minds, hearts, and lives by believing the gospel more and more deeply as life goes on. So, will the gospel be the thing that is of first importance to you? Will you allow the good news of Jesus to transform your mind, your heart, your life, in the new year that's ahead. 
Now, if you've been hanging out around Summit Drive here for a little while, you would know that we, we talk about Jesus a little bit, right? Do we talk about Jesus a little bit around here? I, I think we do. Um, you know, here at Summit Drive, uh, every Sunday morning, we aim to preach the good news of Jesus. Every Sunday morning, uh, we aim to preach the gospel message because we believe that it is this message that has the power to transform lives. But one thing that at least I haven't been quite as good at talking about is what it means to respond to the gospel message. Yes, the gospel is news about what Jesus has done, but it is news that requires a response Many of us are probably familiar with John 3.16, perhaps the most well-known verse in the whole entire Bible. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Yes, God, he so loved the world. He sure did. But notice that the experience of eternal life that the writer talks about here, the experience of eternal life, meaning salvation, meaning knowing God personally, and a whole bunch of other things as well, it's dependent not only on God's love, but also on something else. Pay attention to those words, that whoever believes. Yes, a response is... Required. And the writer of John's gospel continues, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. When it comes to our response to the gospel, I think that sometimes we want to think the good news of Jesus is like a sunset. Now, I love sunsets. I, I really do. Uh, this is a, a, a photo that I took while I was part of a program uh, with a missions organization where I got to suffer for Jesus while living in Hawaii. <laughs> day in and day out, I got to see some of the most beautiful sunsets during my three months of living there. And staring at that was like one of my favorite things to do. In our culture, and for some of us at a personal level, uh, we might want to think that the gospel is, is a little bit like this. It's like a sunset. It's something that we can admire. It's something that we can appreciate. It's something that maybe we can even like deeply, deeply appreciate, but it's something that we look at from afar. And that's a problem. Because it doesn't work like that. As beautiful as sunsets are, when it comes to our response to the gospel message, the gospel is not like a sunset. When it comes to our response to the gospel, the gospel, I will say, is more like a bus. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, imagine that you are at a bus stop. And please indulge in this for a moment as I make up a little story here. Uh, So imagine you're here in Kamloops, you're at a bus stop, and you wanted to come up to the church here in Upper Sahali, and so you needed to take the number nine bus to come on up here, but you just saw your bus go by. You missed it. And then someone else at the bus stop tells you that, you know what, that was the last number nine bus for the day. (laughs) But then you realize that in five minutes from now, the number seven bus is coming, And the number seven bus, it's not going to get you, like, quite where you want to be here in Upper Sahali, but it'll at least get you, like, somewhat close. And now you've got five minutes to make a decision. Are you going to take that number seven bus or not? You know you don't want to pay for a taxi. Your family members and your friends, they're busy, and they can't give you a ride. And now you see the number seven bus approaching the bus stop. And you're forced to make a decision between just two options. You have two options, get on the bus or choose not to. Now, this analogy is not perfect. No analogy is. But when it comes to our response to the gospel message, I think the gospel is a whole lot more like a bus than a sunset. It's something that we have to respond to. 
Again, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. A response is required. And no, making a decision for Jesus, it is not something to be rushed into. It is not something to be taken lightly at all. It's not a decision that has to be made overnight. But for some of you, you might be in a place where you're seeking and deliberating and asking questions. And you know what? It's okay to be in that space, that space of seeking, that space of asking questions and and deliberating. But at the end of the day, there are only two options. Option one, believe. In other words, respond to what God has done for you by placing your trust in Jesus, which involves believing in the content of the gospel. It involves believing that Jesus is who he said he was, believing that he died on the cross and he rose again. But more, to believe in Jesus is to trust in him. Belief is not just the thinking part. It's a little bit more like sitting in a chair, You have to not only believe that the chair can hold your weight, but then actually sit down in it, trusting it will hold your weight and then letting it hold your weight. To believe in Jesus is to trust in him personally, to trust in him as the one who came to save you from sin and to give you new life. It's to say, Jesus, I'm yours now. I choose to believe in you. Even though I might still have questions, I choose to believe in you. I choose to put my trust in you, my hope in you, and what you have done for me. And I choose to make you my, le- my loving leader and my savior now. So that's option number one. Option number two, choose not to believe, which is an option. It's a choice that you can make. Maybe you try to continue to have a mild appreciation for Jesus and Christianity, but at the end of the day, to choose not to trust in Jesus as the one and only Savior and Lord who has come to forgive you and give you new life is to reject him. And while choosing not to get on that number seven bus would have implications for your life, I mean, if you really needed to get to Upper Sahali, you might have to walk all the way up the hill now. But this decision, believe in Jesus or not, it will have major implications for your life that go far beyond that. I recognize that there are people in this room who are exploring the faith. You're still learning about Jesus and the Bible and what all of this stuff means And I'm not saying that you have to make your final decision right now in this moment. But again, when it comes to our response to the gospel, the gospel is a whole lot more like a bus than a sunset. You can't just look at the gospel message from afar. You can't just admire Jesus from afar. The gospel message comes at us and requires us to make a decision. So, Are you in a place where you need to make a decision? Maybe you're a person, maybe you're here, and hey, you've been coming to Summit Drive for a little while, you've been, you know, kind of hanging around church for a little bit, but you're not exactly sure where you're at with Jesus at this point. Maybe the Spirit is prompting you to say yes to Jesus today, to get on that bus, to cross that line of faith. Is that a decision that you need to make today? And to start this new year with this new commitment to Jesus? If it is, please share that with the person who invited you here this morning or share that with myself or one of the other pastors. And we'd love to journey with you on the path of following Jesus. Or maybe others of you, maybe you have questions about this whole like response part. Like, Maybe you're asking, what am I practically supposed to do in response to this message? How do I enter into the Christian faith? Or what's my next step as a Jesus follower? Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, after the Holy Spirit descends on the first Jesus followers, Peter addresses this massive crowd and he gives them a presentation of the gospel message. 
he tells them the story of Jesus. And, and after Peter shares this message, and he declares that Jesus is both Lord and Messiah, we, we then read this. This is starting in verse 37. It says, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Which is a great question. These people know that Jesus cannot just be admired from afar. The gospel is a whole lot more like a bus than a sunset. Some sort of response is required. Some sort of action step needs to be taken. What shall we do, they ask. And the text goes on. Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. What a great moment this is. You know, this was essentially the day, essentially the moment when the church was born. And Peter's words here, I think, are instructive about what we are to do in response to the gospel as well. In Tim Keller's book, The Reason for God, he says that when people ask him the question, how can I actually become a Christian? Or in other words, what should I do in response to the gospel message? Uh, This is what Tim Keller says that he says. He says, it takes two things and a third. It takes two things and a third. We're going to unpack that just a little bit. What are those two things? Keller says, on the one hand, believe in Jesus. Now, we've already talked about that believe in Jesus bit. And I think the Bible is is, is pretty clear. It's faith in the person of Jesus that saves us. Again, John 3.16, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But you see something else in Peter's response in Acts chapter 2. What's the first word out of Peter's mouth here? Believe? Not quite, actually. (laughs) Repent, he says. Now, usually when we hear that word repent, at least for some of us, we might think, you know, like, stop being a bad person and, like, start being a good person. Like, come on, get yourself together. But that's not repentance in the biblical sense. The Greek word for repentance, it's the word metanoia, which basically means change your mind. So, brothers, what shall we do? Repent. Change your mind about Jesus. Change your mind about what matters most in your life. Change your mind about which direction you're going. Change your mind about whom you will ultimately trust in for salvation. Repentance and believing in Jesus, at least in my view, are basically like two sides of the same coin. You can't really have one without the other. But Keller says that To become a Christian takes two things, repentance and believing in Jesus, and a third. And what's the third thing? Involvement in the community of God's people, the church. And we see this also in this text in Acts chapter 2. In verse 41, we read that about 3,000 people accepted this message, and it says that these people were added to their number. In other words, added to the number of those who now make up the community of Jesus followers. As we repent, as we change our minds, and as we place our trust in Jesus and what he has done for us through his life, death, and resurrection, we automatically become a part of this thing called the church. Whether we want to be a part of it or not, we are. And it's not that going to church is what saves you or makes you a Christian. But to be saved into a relationship with God through Jesus is to be saved into 
the community of God's people. The Christian life is not meant to be lived in isolation. You know, for for you, if, if one of your goals for 2024 is to grow in your Christian faith, rubbing shoulders alongside of other Jesus followers will be an essential part of that. Community matters. But you know what? As brilliant as Tim Keller is, I think that there is one more piece that's involved in rightly responding to the good news of Jesus. It takes two things, and a third, and a fourth, I'll say. And what's the fourth thing? Well, in response to that question, brothers, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Did you catch that? Be baptized, he says. And let me ask, does that sound like a suggestion, or does that sound a little more like a command? Kind of sounds like a command, doesn't it? Now, baptism, like involvement in a church community, is not something that saves you. It's not something that, like, makes you a Christian. But it is something that we are to do in response to the gospel once we choose to believe it. Uh, You know, here in this building, um, just to the right of me here, um, some of you know this. Maybe some of you, if you're newer here, you don't know this. But this is our baptismal tank. And um, every few weeks, we fill this up with water, and people get baptized here as part of our services. And we encourage people, if you are someone who has said yes to Jesus, if you're someone who has placed your trust in him, And if you're someone who's chosen to follow him for the rest of your life, this is the next place that you need to go. You need to get baptized if that isn't a step that you've taken yet. Again, baptism is not something that saves us, but baptism is a concrete action that demonstrates our repentance and faith. The Christian faith is not just in our heads or in our hearts but something that takes our whole bodies to respond to. Baptism is the symbol God has given us, and Jesus commands us to do this as a way to show, as a way to to publicly show the faith that we have. And so, for some of you, maybe this is your next step. Maybe you would already say that you've trusted in Jesus, that you love Jesus, but you've never been baptized And if that's you, please do talk to me or or talk to one of the other pastors here, and we'd love to set a date where we can make that happen. Hey, I'll invite the worship team to come back up at this time. Well, it's almost 2024. Where to start? Where to start? For some of you, especially those of you who've been following Jesus for a long time, Uh, maybe you just need to be reminded to make the good news of Jesus that thing that is of first importance in your life for the year that's ahead. In Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, he says that he is eager to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome, people who already believe the gospel, people who already believe in Jesus. Now, why would he say that? Because as believers, we need to hear the good news of Jesus and preach this message to our own hearts again and again and again in a culture where we are bombarded by other messages and other stories all the time. We need to allow this message to shape us and define us and transform us. We need to allow this message to be the thing that we look at everything else through as well. For others of you, As the start of a new year feels like this chance to make some new commitments, maybe, just maybe, for some of you in this room, maybe now is the time to make a commitment to Jesus. Maybe for the first time in your life. Which will start with repentance and trusting in him and what he's done for you. And that's just the beginning of the wild ride of following Jesus. And hey, we'd love to chat more with you if that's where you're at. For still others of you, again, maybe baptism is that next step that you need to take. Baptism is not just something for the elites of faith. It's an early step 
of discipleship to Jesus. And if you don't believe me, you can go home and read Acts chapter 8. We see in Acts chapter 8 that there's this Ethiopian eunuch who hears the message of the good news of Jesus, and pretty much right after that he says, hey, look, there's water. Can I get baptized now? Maybe you've been waiting for that quote-unquote right time to get baptized. Could it be that any time is the right time at this point? That now is the right time for you? 